around 1500 BCE, towards the beginning of what's known as the Late Bronze Age, the major Near Eastern powers were at war with one another. Hatti, the land of the Hittites, had expanded south to the Syrian coast. Mitanni had expanded east to fight for control over that same region. And the Egyptians had begun to take over the Levant and to raid lands ruled by Mitanni. The armies of all these great powers were fighting for control of the same area on the Mediterranean coast. The Egyptian kings claimed, in their royal inscriptions, that after they had raided Mitanni, several ambassadors from different lands showed up in Egypt with gifts for the king, something that had never happened before. These ambassadors came from Hatti, Assyria, Babylonia, among other places. The pharaohs described the gifts they brought as if they were tribute, as though the foreign lands were bowing to the greater power of Egypt. But actually, something quite different was happening. These kingdoms had, for a long time, enjoyed diplomatic relationships with one another, even during times of war. And now they were trying to tame the new imperial power, Egypt. They didn't want Egypt to raid and conquer into their own territories. But they could see that Egypt was rich and powerful. So how could they bring Egypt under control? By treating its king as a diplomatic equal and sending ambassadors with letters and gifts, just as they did to one another. Eventually, even the king of Mitanni did the same, sending ambassadors to Egypt. Amazingly, it worked. By about 1420 BCE, Egyptian raids to the north had stopped, and peace treaties seemed to have been negotiated on all sides. First, the pharaoh probably agreed to peace with Mitanni, then with Hatti, and then with Babylonia. These four, centered in what are now Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Egypt, were all the great powers of the time, pretty much equal in military and economic power, but for now, incapable of conquering one another. The really remarkable thing about Egypt's agreement to join the international community is that the Egyptian kings were willing to adopt the Syro-Mesopotamian diplomatic system as a whole, just as it already existed. They didn't demand to be viewed as greater than the other kings, even though Egypt was arguably the richest of the great powers. The pharaohs were even willing to be called brothers of the other great kings. They didn't insist on writing to their allies in Egyptian hieroglyphs. Instead, they had their scribes trained in cuneiform, and they wrote in the Akkadian language of Mesopotamia. They probably agreed to traditional peace treaties in which the obligations were just the same on both sides. It's as though the only way this diplomatic system could be imagined was just the way it had developed many centuries before in Syria. Kings sent ambassadors to one another's courts with letters and gifts. They agreed to abide by peace treaties watched over by the gods of both lands. They called one another brother. They married one another's daughters, and they wrote in cuneiform on clay tablets. The system was a package. If the Egyptian king wanted to join, he couldn't change it. But the pharaohs did resist just one detail of the diplomatic system. Yes, they would accept foreign princesses as wives, but they would never send any of their daughters away from Egypt to marry another king. Never. Amenhotep III put it this way, from of old, a daughter of the king of Egypt has never been given to anyone. This was a minor detail, and the other kings seemed to have grudgingly accepted it. The norm was for great kings of equal power to be willing to either marry a foreign princess or to send a daughter to marry a foreign king. But the slightly more prestigious role was to give a daughter away. A greater king would send his daughter to marry a lesser king, but would never agree to marry the daughter of a lesser king. If a Near Eastern king married the daughter of a vassal, it would send the wrong message. That vassal would become the greater king's father-in-law, which reversed their hierarchical positions. The Egyptian kings didn't see things this way. To their minds, it was much more prestigious to have many foreign wives of any status. 
So, all the great kings of Egypt, Hatti, Babylonia, and Mitanni were willing to accept this accommodation. If the Egyptian king insisted on only receiving wives and not sending his daughters to the other courts, well, all the kings felt that they had somehow won. The era from 1420 to 1200 BCE is remarkable for the long periods of time when the great powers were at peace with one another as a result of the diplomatic relationships and the marriages between them. It's not that there weren't any battles or wars. There were some, but fewer than in most other eras. The great kings seem to have thrived in this atmosphere. They enjoyed peace and diplomatic relations with their allies, and they sent envoys and letters to one another regularly. We know about all this because we can read and analyze letters written by the kings themselves. Many letters from the rulers of the great kingdoms of Mitanni, Babylonia, Hatti, and Egypt were saved in the archives of Pharaoh Akhenaten in his capital city at Amarna in Egypt. This era is often called the Amarna period. These cuneiform documents were rediscovered in the late 19th century, and they caused quite a stir. No one had anticipated finding a collection of hundreds of cuneiform tablets in Egypt. Because they'd been written on clay tablets, they'd survived just fine. There may have been papyrus records in the same archive, but those have disintegrated. Letters are so different from royal inscriptions, which are usually our main avenue into understanding the politics of any Mesopotamian era. In royal inscriptions, kings put the best possible spin on their actions, and they tended to credit the gods with everything. In letters, the great kings weren't trying to impress the gods or the public. They were negotiating real issues with someone they viewed as an equal, another king. And they were often trying to get something out of their ally. Now, of course, this means that they may not have been entirely honest in the letters, but we can get much more of a sense of their personalities and their motivations. You have a feeling that there was a real complex individual behind the words on the tablet. The great king's letters to one another were full of gripes and insinuations, but at least in the early years of this era, they never threatened military action. Their main concerns were the value of the gifts they sent and received, the treatment of their messengers, and the details of the marriages they arranged between their families. The peace and international cooperation of this era always strike me as amazing. This was followed by a time that was very different, when one great empire after another conquered and ruled the entire Near East, starting with the Neo-Assyrian kings. But the kings who ruled from the 15th to the 13th century BCE mostly didn't want to conquer the other great kingdoms. Some of them never led a military campaign at all. Peaceful relationships suited them. Let's look at the life and times of one of these kings, Tushrata, who played a big role internationally. He was a king of Mitanni in the mid-14th century BCE. Unfortunately, we don't have any of his royal inscriptions. His capital city hasn't been excavated, so there are no archives from his reign. But he wrote letters to two kings of Egypt. They're among the Amarna letters, so that's how we know about him. So what do the Amarna letters tell us about him? One letter from Tushrata to the pharaoh showed that he'd had a tough childhood. His father had been king of Mitanni for some time, and after his father died, Tushrata's brother became king. But this brother was soon murdered, and the assassin took control of the country. He didn't try to make himself king. Instead, he placed young Tushrata on the throne as his puppet. The assassin became the regent, so he made the rules, and Tushrata seems to have had no choice but to obey. One of the demands was that Tushrata had to cut off connections with his allies, including the king of Egypt. The Egyptian king was married to Tushrata's sister, along with many, many other women. So he might well have been alarmed when diplomatic letters stopped coming from Mitanni. Eventually, Tushrata grew up and was able to get his revenge on his brother's assassin. He put it this way, I was not remiss about the unseemly things that had been done in my land, and I slew the slayers of my brother 
and everyone belonging to them. After killing his enemy, he had to deal with an attack by the Hittites. As I said, although this was a comparatively peaceful time, there were still battles. The relationship between Mitanni and the Hittites seems to have always been rather strained. Anyway, Tushrata and his army were victorious, and the Hittites retreated. That was when he decided to re-establish his alliances with the other great powers, his father's former allies. We know he reached out to Amenhotep III in Egypt because his letter survived in Amarna, and he may well have written to the king of Babylon as well. His first letter to Pharaoh Amenhotep III didn't ask for much, just a renewal of diplomatic ties. And he asked the Pharaoh to send his messengers back promptly. Soon after that first contact, though, the two kings started negotiations for a royal marriage. One of the Amarna letters is now in the Vorderasiatische Museum in Berlin, and it contains a letter from Tushrata to Amenhotep III written around this time. It's a fascinating document that reveals a great deal about the international situation of the time, and also about the ways that ambassadors made the whole system work. Tushrata had a daughter named Taduhepa, who was engaged to marry King Amenhotep III. The couple had never met, the princess had never even visited Egypt, and the pharaoh had never visited Mitanni. The whole engagement had been arranged by letter, with a lot of help from the Egyptian ambassador. This was how it happened. Some time before, the pharaoh had sent a letter asking the Mitannian king if he could marry one of the Mitannian princesses, and King Tushrata had been delighted. He'd agreed at once. What could be better than to be related by marriage to his ally, the king of Egypt? Better still, this would make him the pharaoh's father-in-law, which was surely a lofty position. He was actually already the pharaoh's brother-in-law, his sister had married the Egyptian king many years before. But this new wedding would cement their ties. Now, the Mitannian king was almost, but not quite, ready to send the princess to Egypt. A high-ranking Egyptian ambassador named Mane had arrived from Egypt to pick her up. King Tushrata composed a letter to send back to the pharaoh in order to try to buy himself a little more time. This is the letter that's preserved in Berlin. He had, as they say, good news and bad news. He began the letter with some of the good news. The Egyptian ambassador Mane, who had traveled back and forth between Egypt and Mitanni before, had arrived safely in the capital city of Mitanni. Hearing this must have been a relief to the pharaoh when he got the news. The journey from the Egyptian capital of Thebes to the Mitannian capital was about 1,800 miles long. It took about three months to get there and it wasn't necessarily a safe journey. There were letters about envoys and merchants being robbed and even killed en route. We know this from this letter that Ambassador Mane traveled with troops, armed guards to protect both the ambassador himself and the expensive gifts that he was transporting. When the pharaoh had sent Mane off to Mitanni, he knew he wouldn't see him for at least six months, three months to travel in each direction, even if nothing went wrong. But in reality, a diplomatic mission always took longer, because no one arrived and just turned right around and went back. Mane had arrived at the Mitannian court with a letter from the pharaoh. The Mitannian king, Tushrata, wrote in his reply that, I read over and over the tablet which he brought, and I heard its words, and they were very sweet. The words of my brother were as if I saw my brother himself, and I rejoiced on that day very much and I made that day and night a celebration. The arrival of an envoy from a foreign court was almost always the cause of great celebration, whether the man was a Mitannian envoy returning home or a foreign envoy like Mane. Often the celebrations were for two envoys arriving at once, one returning home to Mitanni and one from the land he'd visited, because they tended to travel in pairs, representing both courts. They'd made it, a banquet was called for. King Tushrata gave the pharaoh some more good news. Amenhotep III had included some instructions in his letter, and the Mitannian king promised to carry out every word of my brother that Mane brought to me. He continued, in this very year, now, I will hand over my brother's wife, the mistress of Egypt, 
and they will bring her to my brother. He called his daughter the mistress of Egypt already, even though she hadn't left home yet. But it would be this very year. She'd be coming soon. On that day, he said, will Mitanni and Egypt be as one. A princess who moved away to marry a foreign king had important roles to play. We know from previous eras and from some later evidence that she represented her father in her husband's court. She sometimes wrote letters to her father with information about his ally. She symbolized the uniting of the two lands. And she might even be the mother of the next king in that land. Some scholars have suggested that princesses were just very expensive luxuries acquired in the gift exchanges between the kings. But this was not the case. The women might not have had control over where they were sent or who they married, but they weren't possessions either. That said, though, the Egyptian king, Amenhotep III, had a lot of wives. Not only was he already married to the sister of the Mitannian king, he also had married daughters of a number of his vassals and allies. His court must have felt something like the United Nations today, with many different languages being spoken. And the pharaoh wasn't particularly good at keeping track of his wives. He wrote one very defensive letter to the king of Babylon, who wanted to know if his sister had died. She was married to Amenhotep III. Surely he must know whether or not she was alive. Amenhotep III blustered about in this letter, blaming the Babylonian king for not sending an ambassador who actually knew the Babylonian princess and could recognize her. The pharaoh had presented the Babylonian envoys with his wives, and left it up to them to figure out which one the Babylonian princess might be. The Babylonian king wondered in his letter if his envoys had been shown some other foreign princess. He thought that the pharaoh had tried to fool his ambassadors. But in the end, it seems that no one was really sure what had happened to the Babylonian princess. In some of the other royal courts, the foreign princesses who married the king were very highly regarded and powerful. In the mind of the Mitannian king, the marriage of his daughter to Amenhotep III would symbolize that their two countries had joined together into a single family again. So now, King Tushrata had to share some bad news in the letter. Not everything was ready for the princess's departure. It would be another six months before he was ready to send her, because, he said, of all the work he still had to do on her dowry and on the gifts for the pharaoh. And this meant that, well, he just had to detain Ambassador Mane. As the Mitannian king put it, because of this, Mane will be delayed for a bit. I'm sure he could imagine the pharaoh's disappointment, or possibly his anger. Not only had the young bride not been sent yet, but Amenhotep III's own high official would be gone for another six months as well. But this wait before the princess could leave was unavoidable. The Mitannian king tried to soften the blow. He switched the topic in his letter to talk about his daughter. She wasn't a child anymore. She has become very matured, he said, and the pharaoh will desire her. She is formed according to my brother's desire. Plus, he would be sending all those gifts. The greeting gift that I am giving, my brother will see as being greater than can be reckoned. But King Tushrata wasn't done with the bad news. This letter is fairly typical of diplomatic correspondence of this era tipping back and forth between reasons for celebration, excuses for not fulfilling requests, boasts, and complaints. The king's letters were full of assurance of love for his brother king in Egypt. But there was always just one thing that was really bothering him. And almost always, it had to do with gifts. We've seen this before. Diplomacy in the ancient Near East always included giving and receiving elaborate gifts. It wasn't bad form for a king to specifically request certain gifts. It was bad form, though, to send something that wasn't valuable enough. All the kings made it look as though the gifts they received were freely given by their foreign allies, with no strings attached. But in reality, they were always expected to provide something of equal value in exchange. Egypt was a wonderful partner for the great powers to have because they all wanted gold all the time, and Egypt had tons of it. 
The Babylonian king had horses and lapis lazuli. The Mitannian king had glass and textiles. The Hittite king had silver. And they all produced jewelry, clothing, furniture, sculpture, and so on, in their own distinctive styles. To own these exotic goods and display them, that was a sure sign of one's power. Any rich person in Egypt could own Egyptian linen and faience. How many Egyptians could decorate their rooms with Babylonian tapestries or Hittite silver drinking vessels? In the same way, a big display of Egyptian gold was a clear demonstration of a king's importance. Each time an ambassador arrived, and especially when a royal wedding was in the works, the king anticipated receiving the goods he'd asked for, and perhaps more besides. King Tushrata described the scene. He had gathered together a big group of dignitaries, including all the foreign guests who were there at his court, presumably at the welcome celebration for Ambassador Mane. The usual protocol on such occasions was for the king to display all the magnificent gifts that the Egyptian envoy had brought with him, showing off his new wealth and luxury goods. This time, the sealed packages containing the gifts were to be cut open right there in front of everyone. King Tushrata had asked the pharaoh for a great deal of gold when he last sent a messenger to Egypt. And he obviously anticipated the awe that the gold would inspire in his guests. But when the packages were cut open, there was something wrong with the gold. The guests looked at the supposedly lavish gifts and said, somewhat snidely, are all of these truly of gold? The king of Mitanni, in his letter, didn't say whether he agreed or disagreed with this assessment. He just kept quoting his powerful guests. They said, in the land of Egypt, gold is more plentiful than dirt. He, the Egyptian king, loves you very much. But if there be someone whom he loves, then he would not give such things to him. This was the language that the kings used to refer to their relationships. Kings loved one another if they were allies bound by peace treaties. But the foreign guests quoted here were implying that the alliance between Mitanni and Egypt might have been on rockier ground than the Mitannian king had thought. By quoting his guests here, King Tushrata didn't have to say that he believed this. After all, to do so would imply that his own country was in some way inferior to Egypt, where so many riches were readily available. But he did repeat to the pharaoh what he had replied to his guests. He said, perhaps somewhat despondently, I cannot say before you, my brother, the king of Egypt, loves me very much. He and Amenhotep, who by the way had never met one another, were allies and therefore by definition loving brothers. And yet, the frustratingly inadequate gifts suggested otherwise. King Tushrata included this embarrassing episode in his letter to the pharaoh for a reason. He really wanted gold, and he wanted the pharaoh to know that whatever had been sent from Egypt was just not enough. Only a big shipment of gold would assuage his fear that the pharaoh didn't love him anymore. This was not a good time for the alliance to be in jeopardy. After all, Princess Taduheba would be leaving for Egypt in just a few months. He didn't mince his words as he closed his letter. So, my brother, may he send me much gold that has not been worked. This was crucial. The Mitannian king wanted gold for his own construction projects, and only unworked gold, presumably in bars or ingots, was of any use for that. The pharaoh had been sending gold that had been formed into jewelry or other objects. This was no use for decorating a building. He continued, and may my brother exceed the allotment of my father. He wanted even more gold than his father had received. May Teshub and Amun grant that my brother reveal love of me. Teshub was Mitanni's main god, and Amun was the great god of Egypt. King Tushrata respectfully was asking that the gods of both lands nudge the pharaoh into sending him more gold. And he concluded that if this happened, it would cause me to be glorified in the presence of my country and in the presence of my foreign guests.
So much of this was about appearances. King Tushrata really wanted all those officials and foreign guests to be impressed. Finally, he reminded the pharaoh of the basic rules of diplomacy. He wrote, May I fulfill my brother's heart's desire forever, and may my brother fulfill my own heart's desire. He was saying, you tell me what you want and I'll send it. I tell you what I want and you send it. That was what made the whole diplomatic system valuable to all sides. It made them rich and impressive, and it gave them things they could get no other way. This letter was one of many diplomatic letters found in Egypt from this period, and it reveals so much about the diplomatic system of the time. The types of letters that passed back and forth between kings, the gifts that were expected to accompany them, the way the kings thought of themselves as brothers and were determined to be treated as equals, the choice of Akkadian as the language of correspondence, even when, as in the case of Mitanni and Egypt, it wasn't the native language of either king, the sparring over gifts and perceived slights, and the princess who, like so many other princesses, made the one-way journey to live in the land of her father's ally as his wife. And, rest assured, the story of the royal marriage ends happily. When Princess Taduhepa finally left for Egypt, the amount of wealth that changed hands would have been truly staggering. Tablets survive that list the dowry of Princess Taduhepa. It included almost 1,500 items. This included 42 pounds of gold in various forms, along with jewelry, combs, furniture, blankets, and clothing. As gifts for the pharaoh, separate from the dowry, King Tushrata listed vast amounts of luxury goods, such as horses, gold-plated chariots, horse trappings encrusted with valuable stones and metals, thousands of arrows, javelins, spears, suits of armor, and over a hundred textiles. Mitanni was famous for its woolen textiles, so these must have been spectacular objects. A royal marriage provided an opportunity for extravagant generosity, and it was all made possible by the diplomatic skill of the envoys and the regular exchange of letters between the kings. There's no surviving list of what Amenhotep III sent in return to Mitanni. We do, though, have a list of what his son later sent to the king of Babylon for another wedding. There were more than 3,300 objects, including 1,200 pounds of gold. 